My friend Sally has had a bad run-in with neighbors, but this one was the worst. Sally lives very close to me, about a 10-minute walk. We were both around 14 when this happened. We live in a rural area, so we both have a lot of land. So, with nothing else to do, Sally and I decided to go camping on her land. We bought cheap hammocks and went through the bushland. The days prior, we spent clearing some of the razor grass with a cane knife to make a path. We probably should have worn long pants because we ended up with little cuts all over our legs and some on our arms. We set up a few hammocks then and brought quite a few blankets because it was getting pretty cold at night, even though we were sweating throughout the day. We were still on our property and hadn't gone to her neighbor's boundary. Her neighbor had just leased the land to some new tenants. Sally and I were sitting in our hammocks talking and laughing and it was around 9pm. We heard something in the bush. We just thought that it was a wallaby. There are plenty of wallabies around here. But then we could see a figure of a man. We were whispering to each other trying to see who it was. At first we thought that it was a brother. He had come out and scared us when we were camping previously. But then as the person got closer, we were thinking that it could have been her dad. It was dark and the bush looks the same from every angle. We realized the man was coming from the other direction that wasn't from her house. We didn't dare move and covered our torches under our blankets. The man came up and said hi and introduced himself as Ben. Now Ben was extremely drunk and he staggered around and he reeked of alcohol. He started saying how we had a nice little camp here and said something pretty unsettling. I'll have to come out and sunbake naked here on one of these hammocks. Me and Sally gave each other worried looks but didn't say anything. It only got worse from here. I can't remember everything he said because it was a while ago and he was mumbling on for what felt like forever, but some of the things just stuck out. I'll have to kill you as Wolf Creek style, and he said, you're nearly legal then, when he asked about her age. Ben was probably in his 40s. Sally and I were texting each other while he was talking and coming up with an escape plan. He also offered us a puff on the magic dragon and pulled out a glass pipe. We declined. Sally said that we were leaving back to our house to make food. He told us to come back. We left our blankets and most of our stuff there and we liked it. We told her dad what had happened and we slept inside. The next morning, we went back to our campsite to find everything burnt. A circle with probably about a 20 meter radius was all burnt. And coming from that circle was a line of burnt grass going towards the neighbor's house. Now, I'm not a firefighter or do forensics, but it seemed obvious that some kind of fuel was used. Sally and I were talking and it dawned on us, the possibility that Ben may have thought that we were in the hammocks due to the pile of blankets. Ben was definitely drunk enough not to be able to tell the difference. We went and told Sally's dad who then checked it out and then went next door. Ben's roommate answered the door and said that Ben wasn't home and apologized, and even gave Sally's dad $50 for the blankets and hammocks. Nothing more happened for a few months. Sally told me at school about how Ben had been caught on camera sneaking around her yard. I went to her house after school because she was going to be home alone until her dad finished work. I ended up sleeping over there that night, and that's when he came over Ben was drunk and came out the front of Sally's house and started yelling that he had accused Sally of stealing his dog. Sally's dad called the police and they arrested him. The next day, we found a knife in the yard and it wasn't from Sally's house. And the police came again and we told them about the knife and they got the footage from the cameras as well. I don't know what happened to Ben, but he no longer lives next to Sally. Okay, so this happened when I was around 9 years old. I'm 25 now. 
and it's something that I will never forget. It gives me goosebumps to this day. I live in a terraced house, it's four houses combined, and my neighbors and I each have our own little patio. There is a small road, 10 meters from a yard where people do their Sunday walks and so on. Only a small fence separates my small yard and patio from that road. I live in a pretty crowded area, with several of those terraced houses spread across to my neighborhood. So seeing people walking down that road is pretty normal for me. Seeing random people standing on my patio is not. When I was nine, I usually got home from school about an hour before my mom got home from work. I live maybe 10 meters away from school, so my mom figured I was mature enough to be home alone for around an hour before she got home. This one day that I got home from school, I did the usual thing which was to make sure I locked the front door and double checked that the back door leading to the patio was also locked. I was nine. Being alone was a little scary even though it was in the middle of the day and only for an hour. I then would rush to my room upstairs to play as much PlayStation as possible before my mom came home and made me do homework. While playing, I heard this noise coming from outside my window. My room was located one floor above the patio, with a view to the road that I told you about before. It was kind of like the sound of a cat, but my cat had been missing for over three months. Hope sparked and I thought, did she finally come back? I ran downstairs to check if it was my cat. But the sight that met me gives me goosebumps just writing this. There's a guy standing on my patio. A tall guy with black hair covering half of his eyes. Making him look like a male version of the ring woman or something. I could hear him making high pitched sounds. Almost like a cat meowing. A brown liquid was running down from his mouth. And I could see him spitting out my dad's stopped cigarettes. He was actually eating from the ashtray. I was frozen observing this. Eventually snapped out of it and screamed so loud that the man must have heard it. He didn't react. He kept on eating from the ashtray. I ran upstairs to my room, locked the door and called my mom who then called the cops. I've never been more terrified in my life. Laying in bed under my sheets, shivering with fear. As I hear these creepy, high-pitched noises from the guy eating cigarette stomps from the ashtray on my patio, I kind of blacked out for a moment, because the next thing I remember is the police arriving on the road by my yard. I hear them talking to the guy saying stuff like, What are you doing? Get over here, or we'll come down and arrest you, and so on. He didn't respond, but the high-pitched sounds were more frequent and louder. I decided to look through the window, feeling safe now that the cops were there. I could see two police officers standing by my fence, one man and a woman. I did not see the creepy man, however, because he was standing directly one story under me and out of my field of view. The police jumped the fence, and I remember hearing the creepy guy screaming louder than anything I'd ever heard before. He charged the female police officer with full force and he knocked her out cold. The male officer then immediately tased the guy, leaving him shaking on the ground, screaming still. The policeman struggled to keep him on the ground while putting handcuffs on him, but eventually he made it. After a while, he had managed to wake up the female officer, who seemed to be badly hurt. He called for backup in an ambulance, and then he sees me standing in the window above him, the expression on my face must have been something else, because he just looked at me and said, I sure as hell hope you didn't see all that. And I started to cry. By this time, neighbors started to arrive wondering what the hell was going on. One of my neighbors, an elderly woman, made me come down and she took care of me until my mom came back home. The police took the creepy guy with them in the car and they eventually left. Before they left... They promised to come back and talk to us about what had happened. This is where the story takes an unexpected turn. The male police officer came back later that night and sat down with me and my mom to talk. 
He explained that the guy on my patio was actually diagnosed with severe autism. He had escaped a facility where mentally challenged people live, located around 5 kilometers from where I live. He explained that the guy had actually been living in my house 5 years ago, but he had been forced to move when his mom, his only caretaker, had died. The poor guy probably thought he would find his mom in my house. He missed the routines and he missed living there with his mom. The police had to move him from the house that time five years ago because he was extremely strong. From what I heard, he had extreme tensions in the body because of the autism, making his muscles grow stronger and stronger throughout the years. This was the reason he had reacted the way he did when the police came this day. Still frightened, I told the police officer that he needed to make sure this would never happen again, and he promised that it wouldn't. After a few sleepless nights, my life got back to normal. The years went by and the guy didn't come back, until one year ago. At this time, my mom and dad had moved out, and I had bought the house from them, and I'm still living there today. I was enjoying my morning coffee on the patio when... I see this random guy stopping on the road by my fence. He just stands there looking at me. I look at him and I give him a nod. And then I hear the high pitched noises. Holy crap, it's him. His hair had turned gray, but the high pitched noises made me realize. My heart started racing and I instantly remembered the reason why he was back. I realized that he must have managed to get out again. Because I kept my cool a bit longer than when I was nine, I started to realize how sorry I felt for the guy. Sixteen years later and he was back to look for his mom. I decided to carefully ask him if he wanted to come down to the patio. He instantly jumped the fence. I started to think that he would knock me out like he did to that police officer. He didn't. He smiled and he looked at me and smiled. I offered him to sit down. He didn't respond. I offered him to come inside. He started laughing. We went inside and his face lit up with pure joy. He was home. It reminded him of the life he had with his mom. It almost made me tear up. All of a sudden he sat down on my couch, turned on my TV, and switched directly to the cartoons. I observed him for a while. He was just completely focused on the cartoons. I just wanted him to enjoy the moment, so I didn't say anything to him. But I realized that I had to call the facility to let them know. And the caretakers arrived 10 minutes later. After a lot of convincing, he got back up crying, and they went back to the facility. I called the facility two days later, and we made a deal. His name is Tom, and I now consider Tom my friend. Every Sunday from the day that he returned, Tom and his caretakers visit me to watch cartoons. They say that it's the highlight of his week, and it makes my heart warm. Now, for several years, my thoughts were, let's not meet. Guy in my patio eating from the ashtray. But now my thoughts are, let's meet every Sunday to watch cartoons. My friend Tom... Several years ago, when I was 25, I lived with, at the time, one of my best friends. Our friendship eventually started to dwindle, as it usually goes when you move in with a good friend, so she was rarely home. This night, however, she ended up staying at her place, heading to bed early. I was a server at the time, so I stayed up pretty late, usually watching YouTube and smoking pot. This night was no different than any other except for the fact that my neighbor has tried to kidnap me. I'll go ahead and give some background info on my house and my neighbors. Uh, we lived in a three-bedroom house with two bedrooms and the kitchen facing the crazy neighbors. They were a younger couple living in a smaller mill house. They were constantly coming out to our door asking for handouts. Now normally, I would be happy to help out a neighbor but they would come over and ask for crazy stuff, like us to fill up an old Mountain Dew bottle with water, because theirs got shut off, beer, and once literally to ask for a single dollar. 
They would constantly be knocking at our door to ask for help, and when we wouldn't answer, I'd peek through the window to see them either jacking cigarette butts from the ashtray or pressing their eyeballs against the door people to see if they could spot us. Anyway, there I was smoking some weed and watching YouTube on my couch when I heard a knock at the door. I rolled my eyes cause I knew exactly who was knocking. It was 11pm. I checked the people and sure enough, the boyfriend was on my porch. Normally, I would just walk away and continue with my life. But he looked like he was in distress. I opened the door up to see what was up. Hey, uh, I just wanted to come over here and see if you would uh, fill my engagement. I uh, got my girlfriend a ring here in my pocket and I need you to follow me to my backyard and film it for me. Baffled but curious. I told him congrats and that uh, I would be out in a second. I just needed to put shoes on. I shut the door behind me and locked it. And quickly, I ran to the back room that looked out into the backyard. I peeked through the blinds to see the setup. Nothing. Pitch black darkness. No signs of decorations or anything like that. Naturally, I woke my roommate up and told her what was going on. Uh, yeah, forget that, she said to me. And we both walked back up to the door after the boyfriend had started banging on it. I looked through the people again. I couldn't see anything and was confused all the way up until he pulled his eyeball away from the people. I quickly turned around and put my back up against the door. My roommate came running back to the door from her room, manning two wire hangers for protection. We both clung onto the hangers and sat up against the door until he finally left. We were so freaked out, but we wanted to make sure that we weren't overreacting. We went out to our back door and hopped into her car so we could do a drive-by. They always had their front door open and also didn't have any blinds, so it was easy to see inside of their house. Slowly, we crept by on her car and peered into the living room. Sitting on the couch and all, staring at the wall, they looked strung out. It was the couple and an older man. We sped off and ended up staying at a friend's house that night. I never answered the door for either of them again. One day I came home from work and an older lady was parked in their driveway. She walked up to me and got out of the car and asked if I knew where the neighbors were. I told her that I hadn't seen them for a while and she informed me that she was the owner. She told me that they were months late on rent and finally came to evict them. She entered the home to find it completely trashed. Needles and garbage everywhere, holes in the wall, and literal crap on the floor. I told her that I was sorry to hear that she had to deal with all that, but I was happy that they were finally gone. I'm not 100% sure what was going on that night, but I'm glad I didn't follow him into the backyard. It was an early summer morning and the sun was up, but a few people were out. In fact, these streets were practically dead that morning. My mom decided to take my sister, only one year old at the time, seated in the stroller and I, to throw away some garbage at the garbage station. I might add that the garbage station is kind of secluded from nearby houses, bordering one of those deep, dark forests of eastern Sweden. Since I was only four when this happened, the memories from the incident had faded a lot. However, my mom remembers all of it. She says that upon entering the station, she immediately got an eerie feeling of being watched. I remember that feeling too. I felt creeped out, even though I didn't know why I was scared. I guess I could sense my mom's fear. Walking along that secluded garbage station, my mom suddenly stopped and told me this. Hold on to the stroller as hard as you can and don't let go, no matter what. That's my most vivid memory I have of this, and I don't think I'll ever forget those words. I'll at least never forget how they made me feel. It was as if my blood had turned to ice. I just froze. 
My mom sounded stern, but even a toddler can sense when someone's scared out of their mind. My mom was definitely afraid of something. The rest is just a blur. I don't remember much apart from the aforementioned, so I'll let the rest of the story be told from the perspective of my mother. This is the recollection of her experience, recalled to the best of my abilities, but in my own words. Not far from where we were standing, a truck was parked with a man seated in the front. Nothing unusual, a lot of truck drivers stopped to rest by the side of the road. But this man was staring, and he wouldn't stop staring. He stared right at me, examining my body with the determined gaze of a predator. Gluing the three of us in his sight, he truly seemed pleased by the fear he had instilled on our faces. And his eyes, they were something else. Almost as if they didn't belong to a human, but rather to a predator on the savannah. I felt like prey, stuck in the claws of a lion, and I couldn't move. And that's when he smiled at me. I remember that dead smile, those cold, calculating eyes, and the way that he licked his lips, almost as if to say, I could kill you all if I wanted to. I believed this was the point in time, into this strange encounter, when my mom told me to hold on to the stroller, to hold on tightly and not let go. My mom is a small woman, 160 centimeters, weighing only about 48 kilograms, and she could easily have been overpowered by the overweight man in the truck. My mom later admitted she was afraid he would jump out of the truck and knock her out possibly assaulting her, or even taking me and my younger sister. We bolted out of there. We didn't throw away much garbage that morning. We just turned around and walked home as quickly as my mom could do with a stroller and a four-year-old toddler at her side. We never talked about what happened that day, up until very recently. The incident has always lingered somewhere in the back of my mind, as that weird thing that happened when I was a kid. And every time I walk past that garbage station, I get a weird feeling in the pit of my stomach. As previously mentioned, this happened around 2006. Fast forward to 2008. The face of a 10-year-old little girl called Engla was printed across the front page of every newspaper in sight. She had been kidnapped and murdered, and the perpetrator was an overweight truck driver named Anders Uckland, now known as one of Sweden's most infamous killers. Anders Uckland was charged with the murder of Engla, alongside the murder of a woman named Pernilla. Mandy's also suspected of abducting another little girl, who's still currently missing, making him more than one thing. And my mom says that when she saw Uckland's picture in the paper, when she saw those cold, familiar eyes, she knew that he was the creepy man from the garbage station that early morning all those years ago. Thinking how my mom or my sister or me or all of us could have been his victims, that sends chills up my spine. Anders, even though you're behind bars, let's never meet again. So, it's taken me a while to decide to write all of this down because this story has multiple parts that may or may not be connected. It might be a long one and a little anticlimactic, as it's not as creepy or traumatic as some other stories. But it's taken weeks for me to get a good night's sleep since Ronald Simmons came banging on my door. Here's the setup. I live on a little dirt road in southern Ohio, which sounds rural and farmy, but it sits right up against a complex of subsidized apartments and a major thoroughfare for the area. It's a weird mix of transients and longtime residents, young families and lone elderly people. One house might be meticulously kept and maintained, but then the neighbor might have a jet ski in the yard and a tree wrapped in chicken wire as a makeshift cage for their pet parrot. 
Not a random example, it's a real thing. I've lived here for nearly 10 years and for more than 9 of those years, it's just been my daughter and I. She's 10 now but I still don't like to let her play alone in the yard, and I'm obsessed about keeping our doors closed and deadbolted at all times, even when we're just chilling at home. I keep to myself and don't ask questions or cause problems. I'm an introvert whose primary goal in life is to leave and be left alone. And then Tom moved in. So imagine that the neighborhood is kind of laid out like a four rung ladder. I live on the third rung and going left to right it takes you to a road that leads to the aforementioned main thoroughfare and exits the neighborhood. Tom moves into a house near one of these exit roads just a few houses down from me on the opposite side of the street, which I was wholly unaware of until I was out to my yard one day a few years ago and a passing car slowed and the window rolled down. Now, I've had sketchy experiences with scammers and solicitors in the neighborhood before. There's a whole story about a group that tried to convince me to get in their car and take money out of the ATM for them. So I'm highly skeptical and suspicious of any strangers that want to just stop for a chat. Plus, I had never seen this guy before. Heavy set, salt and pepper hair, heavy lidded eyes and probably in his 50s at least. I was 26 at the time, so he had to be around twice my age. So Tom slows the car and rolls down the passenger window. He says something, but I can't hear him, so I take a hesitant step closer to the vehicle, hoping that he's just asking for directions. Hey, girl, he says, and all my hackles immediately go up at the positively greasy way he says the word, girl. I'm Tom. Just moved in down the street there. Oh, I tell him, off my footing. Okay. What's your name, honey? Now, calling me honey is usually a great way to make me upset, but there was something about him, even in those first few moments that set off alarm bells. Sometimes, it's not a big deal to tell a creep to screw off, but other times, there's a voice that goes, this one is a time bomb, do not set him off. And so I tell him my name in the hope that he's just being neighborly because, hey, Maybe he's a nice grandpa who hasn't gotten the memo about using girl and honey. It's southern Appalachia. He wouldn't be the only one. But then... You got a boyfriend? I think every woman probably has that little oh god moment every time this question gets asked by a random. I'm so taken aback and still trying to feel out the interaction that I just say something in the negative because it's true. I don't have a boyfriend. For a good reason, I'm gay, but at this point in my life, that's still very private information, and I don't feel obligated or inclined to provide that detail to him. You should let me take you out sometime, he says. We can have a few beers. At this point, all of my skin is crawling and I decline as politely as I can. He persists and the interaction feels like it takes a lifetime. But I'm guessing it's about 10 or 15 minutes because I successfully inch my way back to my front door and make an excuse to go back inside. I was hoping that, that would be the last time that I would have to talk to Tom, but of course it wasn't. For weeks, it seemed like every time that I stepped outside, there was Tom in his car, slowing down to talk to me about this or that, but mostly trying to convince me to go out with him. When are we going to go to dinner? I always said no as politely as I could. It was annoying and stressful, but manageable. And then it escalated. I'm sitting at home one day and there's a knock at my door. I don't have a peephole or any means of knowing who's at my door without sticking my whole dang head out of my front window. So mostly, I just don't answer the door unless I'm expecting someone. If it's someone that I know, they'll call me on my phone or announce themselves at the door. So, I just let the knocking go. And then my doorbell rings. And then there's more knocking and more knocking and more freaking knocking. And so finally I'm like, maybe the neighbor's house is on fire or something, I don't know. I answer the door and of course it's Tom. 
Hey girl. He says with a slick, ominous grin that never reaches his eyes. How you doing? I wanted Tom to go screw himself, but not more than ever. My instincts are telling me not to make him angry. He's clearly not afraid to push a boundary, and he lives basically just two or three houses down. All I can imagine is him going home and stewing over my insults, my rejection, and then only having to walk like two minutes to get back at me. So I make the conversation as short as possible, decline all of his advances as politely as possible, and deadbolt my door as quickly as possible once he's gone. He starts coming around at least once a day, and I stop answering the door. He persists with his knocking, pounding loudly and angrily on the door when I won't answer. But I am not going to voluntarily engage with this dude in any way. One day, I am sitting in my living room floor working on something and the knocking starts. I ignore it. It gets more insistent and angry. He calls my name, but he can't prove that I'm home, so screw him. And then, and then, he tries the handle on my door. I always deadbolt the door, thank God, but the actual door handle is usually a lot. So I was sitting right there, not three feet from the door, when I saw and heard it turn violently. If it hadn't have been deadbolted, he would have walked right in and found me sitting in the floor. I probably should have called the police, but I had never called the cops on anyone before. It seemed so extreme. He went away shortly after and I just let it go. So stupid. On another day, I'm out mowing my lawn, headphones in. When I look up, here comes Tom. I can't get away from this dude and it starts making me feel absolutely trapped. Of course he wants to talk. And because I'm a non-confrontational moron at the time, I stop mowing and I pull out my headphones. He tells me that he can help me with the mowing. A pretty girl like me shouldn't have to mow her own yard. All I gotta do is come down and ask him. He tells me how he helps out Eric all the time. Eric lives two houses down from me, almost directly across from Tom. And Eric is a constant habitual public drunk. He doesn't bother anyone, just staggers around his yard, hangs out on the couch in his driveway, and feeds these stray cats. Which is problematic because it means we have a booming population of feral, half-mad cats running amok. But I feel for him. I'm an animal person, so I get it. I've seen Tom and Eric together sometimes, and I guess that they're friends. Tom says that he mows Eric's grass and that he can mow mine too. But I've never seen Tom mow anything. And besides, like, holy crap, man, just leave me alone. He goes on to say that he sees me driving by his house sometimes. Yeah, there's only two ways off the street. And the shorter route is past his house. So I have, by default, driven past his house. But I won't anymore. Never again. I'll take the long way if it kills me. I decline his help, and I decline and decline and decline. I start avoiding being outside at all costs. I usher my daughter as quickly as I can to and from the car. I carry groceries in as quickly as possible. But even then, he can see me from his house. And as I'm rushing towards the door, I will sometimes hear a loud, low wolf whistle. And I look up to see Tom waving at me. I usually pretend that I don't see him or hear him, and I deadbolt the door as quickly as I can. At some point in the following days or weeks, I order a pizza. When there's a knock at the door, I answer it immediately. For a bewildering second, I can't figure out why my pizza man is shirtless. But it's not my pizza man. It's Tom and his enormous bear beer gut. He's swaying a little bit and he leans in against my door frame. He pushes a piece of paper into my hand and explains that this is his phone number. He asks again if I've got a boyfriend yet. At this point, I'm desperate and I feel like it's a bad idea to just blurt out that I'm a lesbian Tom. For one, I feel like this won't deter him in fact. I feel like it might just make him upset and make me a target for something even worse. In fact, it might make me a target with the whole neighborhood. 
Which sounds extreme, but the first year that I lived here, a guy was beaten to death just up the street. He wasn't gay, and it's a longer story. But I've always stayed aware that violence wasn't an impossibility. Plus, I don't have a girlfriend either. It's just me and my daughter all the time. I just needed this guy to leave me alone. I've never met someone who was so completely put me on edge. I kept thinking how easy it would be for him to just push past me into the house. I could see him doing it to my head. There is a constant feeling that he was just on the edge of moving, of pouncing. So I just lie to him and say that, yes, I have a boyfriend and that we're very happy. Thank you so much, hetero bliss. He grins that dark, greasy grin and he says, I ain't seen no man around here. He's watching me in my house, watching who comes and goes. This and the fact that he's actually trying to challenge my lie makes my blood go cold. It's like it's a game for him. Because he doesn't say it angrily, he says it like it's cute. Like he's caught me against a wall. Like, like I'm prey. And he knows that I'm defenseless. I mean, I'm not defenseless. Even as I'm imagining him pushing his way into the house, I'm also imagining what I can use as a weapon. Planning to go straight for his eyes, his nose, the growing. I wouldn't go down without a fight, that's for sure. But I make up something stupid, like how my pretend boyfriend is in the military, and that he's away right now, but we're very happy, and no, I didn't want to have any beer you're carrying with you for some reason. He launches into a litany of questions about my pretend soldier boyfriend. How many trucks does he have? Is he good looking? Do I think that Tom is good looking? Does he take care of me the way Tom could take care of me? Is Tom good looking? Tom has two trucks, you know. He could take care of me. Is my boyfriend a black guy? The last question shuts me down entirely and somehow makes me both scared and more upset. I already know that he's a creepy piece of crap. But now he's a racist, a creepy piece of crap. This guy just keeps getting worse and worse. I rebuke him again and tell him that I have to go. He says, Well, what your boyfriend don't know won't hurt him. I make him leave. He comes around periodically for a few more years, leaves some gifts at my door at some point, an old doll and some kind of toys from his garage. I think that they were for my daughter, but I just threw them away. It seems to go on forever and I debate calling the cops. I keep thinking that he's just right down the road and if I call the cops, it's going to become a whole thing. It might escalate more. What are the cops going to do? They can't be there every day. And he hasn't even done anything criminal yet. I don't have a leg to stand on. But eventually, gradually, he leaves me alone. Thank God, I think he got a girlfriend, maybe. I don't know. The whole thing has taken place over the last 4 or 5 years, but the last several months, maybe 12 or 18 months or so, have been very quiet. And I can only assume that he had moved away, or had gotten the message or all the above. I barely even see him. Cut to about 3 weeks ago. I am sitting on my couch late in the evening around 10 o'clock, when I hear a noise out on the sidewalk. I pause and listen and then someone turns my doorknob. It's deadbolted like always, thankfully. I'm alarmed now and the banging at my door starts. I can't see who it is, but I know that I'm not expecting any visitors. The banging turns frantic, urgent, but I wait. More knocking and knocking and knocking. I think that maybe it's my parents. Maybe something has happened to my dad. He had a history of heart problems. But why wouldn't they call? Why wouldn't they right now just call out and announce who they are? And then I hear a low, male voice say, Man, screw this. Oh God. More knocking and turning on my doorknob. Knocking even on my window now, the one just beside the door. I'm scared now, but I also know for sure that I don't know who it is, and I'm not opening that door. It also made me kind of mad. I'm like, what? You're coming up on my sidewalk and banging on my door while I'm trying to play some Animal Crossing. 
So I go to the door and shout through it, demanding to know who's there. He calls back. Nikki, it's me, Ronald Simmons. I've got Eric's beer. Let me in. Okay, my name's not Nikki. I don't even know a Nikki, let alone a Ronald Simmons. And Eric lives two more houses down. Clearly, he just has the wrong house. And this situation should be easily cleared up. I don't know who you are. I tell him to the door. You have the wrong house. You need to go. But he just bangs in the door some more. Insists that he doesn't have the wrong house. Come on, Nikki. Stop messing around and just open the door. It's me, Ronald Simmons. I have Eric's beer. He yells at me, tries the door again. Bangs on the window in an absolute frenzy. My name isn't Nikki. I yell back. You have the wrong house. You need to get out of here or I'm calling the cops. But he just keeps shouting and banging, calling me by the wrong name, begging me to just open the door. And he keeps repeating his name, his whole name, Ronald Simmons. It's me, it's Ronald Simmons. I have Eric's beer. Open the door, just open the door. It's Ronald Simmons. We go back and forth for what feels like an eternity, but probably it was only 10 minutes or less. By this time, my kid had heard the commotion and is scared. And I'm not sure if he's going to escalate, but he definitely isn't listening to me, and he doesn't seem to be going away. I'm freaked out by how he keeps begging me to just open the door. Like maybe he doesn't have the wrong house at all and is just trying to get me to come outside. Tom has also come to mind, because he and Eric, they're friends, remember? So even though I don't want to, I call the cops. I tell Ronald Simmons that I've called the cops and everything goes quiet for a moment. I think maybe that that was enough to make him go away. I explain to the operator what's happening and they instantly dispatch someone. The operator asked if the man was still there, right as Ronald Simmons begins banging on the door and the windows again. Yeah, he's still here. I think he's confused but he won't leave. No, I don't know him. His name is Ronald Simmons. No, I don't know what he looks like. I can't see him. No, I'm not going to put my face in the window. He's still hitting the window on the door. You need me to look to get a description. God, okay. So I pull away the curtain and then lift away the heavy, difficult Venetian blinds. But it's pitch black and my porch light it doesn't work. All I can see is a bicycle ditched on my front sidewalk. I hear a woman shouting and it's difficult to make out. But it sounds like she's yelling at Ronald Simmons, telling him that he's got the wrong house. I think that it might be one of my immediate neighbors, but I'm not sure. Min doesn't stop him. He tells her to screw off and he keeps yelling at me. It feels like a lifetime passes, and the awareness that someone, some intruder is just a wall away is overwhelmingly surreal. I can hear him pacing up and down the sidewalk talking to me and himself. It feels like maybe he's searching for an entry point, but I can't tell for sure, all I can do is listen. I explain everything to the operator as it's happening, and it really doesn't take very long for the flashing lights to appear on my street. I hear officers calling out to Ronald Simmons, and then an exchange of dialogue, but I'm still not opening that door. It's hard to make out all the words, but I distinctively hear an officer say, so, why are you out here bothering this nice lady? Finally, somebody knocks and announces that he's one of the police officers. When I finally open the door, the said officer asks a few questions. Did he try to actually break into the house? I mean, no, but he kept trying my door like a maniac. He was looking for Eric's home down the street. Yeah, I know that. He wouldn't stop saying it. I tried to tell him that he had the wrong house. This is your bike. No. Okay, we'll make sure that he leaves with it. You have a nice night now. I have no idea what happened from there. No idea if they just took him to Eric's house or what. I saw him briefly standing in the headlights of the cop car on the road, talking to another officer. Skinny, hair buzzed so short as to be non-existent. Clothes a little too big. I had never seen him before in my life. I assume that they didn't arrest him. I guess he really hadn't done anything criminal. But it still took hours for my heart to slow down and the adrenaline to wear off. 
I didn't sleep. I just waited for him to come back or for something else to happen. In the morning, my daughter and I went outside and found that one of our planter boxes on the porch had been demolished. It was kind of old anyway and probably just got stepped on in the scuffle. I left it alone because it felt weird to touch anything to do with Ronald Simmons. It took several more days for me to finally gather up the scraps and throw it away. It's been three full weeks and yesterday my daughter says, Mom, didn't we hide our spare key under that box? When I heard that, my soul left my body. She was right. Our old hiding spot had been really high, and it was very hard to access so the last time we had used it, I had just tucked it under that planter and forgot to move it again. But when I cleaned the box up, I never saw it. I checked these shrubs and soil nearby. I checked the entire small porch and stoop area. I checked and checked, but I couldn't find it anywhere. Now, maybe it had gotten thrown away with the box. Maybe it was just in the shrubs or the grass or something and I couldn't find it, maybe. But I changed the locks that day, just in case. To beat it all after a long, long period of nothing, I was going out to my car one day this week and heard a loud, low wolf whistle. It's Tom, waving at me from up the street. I pretend that I don't see him and I get in my car. There's some other unsettling things going on that are kind of their own story. Like the teenage kid who lives behind me who keeps throwing random toys and household items into my yard from a second story apartment window. There's also the two times this past month that I have been woken up by what I'm fairly certain was someone tapping on my bedroom window in the small dark hours of the morning. But Ronald Simmons really messed me up and has left me in a constant state of vigilance. Living basically alone lends a certain amount of nighttime paranoia. But now, I'm always wildly fluctuating between the 30 and 99% certain that someone is in my house, or just outside of my window, or both. And it doesn't help that it seems like Tom, who still lives just down the street, might possibly have some involvement. Or maybe Ronald Simmons was just some random drunk dude, and I'm blowing everything out of proportion. Either way, for the love of God, Ronald Simmons and Tom from down the street, let's not meet again. This all started about a year ago. I lived on the second floor of an apartment complex and have lived there my entire life. The building is mostly comprised of families with young children and married couples. A lot of families have lived here as long as my family has, so everyone knows each other pretty well. There is only one apartment unit that isn't occupied by a family, but rather a pair of brothers who keep to themselves. One day, one of their sons around my age appeared out of the blue. He was strange off the bat. He would always wear his sweatshirt with the hood up and he would run through the apartment complex to get to his apartment. I'm not sure what his face looked like because he always had the hood over it. He lived on the first floor, on the back side of the complex, and would often get into his place by jumping through the window. He basically did everything in his power to avoid any interaction. I didn't mind him because I never saw him due to my busy schedule. However, one day, he started sitting on the top of the staircase that leads to my apartment. This was strange because his apartment unit was on the other side of the complex and on the first floor. I brushed it off at first, but it started happening every day. When I would come home from school, he was there. When my boyfriend at the time would drop me off at night, typically around 10.30 or 11, he would be there. Sometimes when I would leave and come back hours later, he would still be in the exact same spot, as if he didn't move throughout the five hours that I was gone. At this point, I told my parents and my boyfriend about it, and they became very vigilant. My boyfriend would park his car and walk me to the door every night that he dropped me off. Once he saw my boyfriend, he stopped sitting on the staircase and I thought it was over, but it wasn't. He started waiting for me at my bus stop. The bus that I take home from school stops right across the street from my home, so it's a short walk. 
One day when I was getting off, I saw him waiting at the bus stop. Once he saw me get off, he followed me into the complex and sat on the staircase. He also started following me when I would walk my dog. At this point, my parents were upset. My mom started letting the neighbors know he was following me around. My neighbors started making sure that he wasn't bothering me, or if I was alone, they would start a conversation with me until I got into my door. One day, I got a friend request on Facebook from this guy. Mind you, he had never spoken a word to me, so how did he know my name, let alone find me on Facebook? My mom tried talking to his father, but they would never answer the door when my mom knocked on it. So I'm thinking, it can't possibly get any worse, right? He seemed harmless, so I wasn't too worried. I was wrong. One day, when I returned from my boyfriend's house, my mom told me that she had something to tell me, but she didn't want me to get spooked. She proceeded to tell me that when she was walking towards the kitchen to get a glass of water, when she saw something in the tree move. Our kitchen has a huge window that takes up most of the wall. In front of the window, there's a huge tree. If someone were to climb it, they could see right into our apartment. Well, guess what? When my mom took a closer look, she realized my neighbor was sitting in the tree looking straight into the apartment. My mom called my dad over, and when my neighbor saw my dad, he jumped off the tree. At that moment, I felt my peas stolen from me. We filed a police report, but when the police went looking for him, he was gone. It turned out that there were snack wrappers and a blanket hidden in between the leaves of the trees. The police think that it wasn't the first time that he was up in the tree. I couldn't help but wonder how many times he saw me walking around and I had no idea. It's been about six months and I haven't seen him since. His father still lives in the complex, but there's no sight of him. The police haven't been able to find him, so I have no idea what happened to him. But I hope that we never meet again. This happened yesterday, and I still can't believe that it happened. I'll explain it all at the end. I'm sorry if it's confusing at first. I recently moved into a new flat three weeks ago, and I'm sharing it with my sister. The only person that we know properly is a single mother who lives in the apartment next door to us. Ever since we moved in, she's been giving us advice and helping us out with things. We don't know anyone else properly yet. Our neighbors are mostly couples in their late 20 or 30s, or older guys who live alone. We're probably the youngest ones here. We're both females, I'm 18 and my sister is only 16. Today, I was out with some friends and then later on, I went to the gym. After this, I went to get my sister so we could go out for some food. We got in at around 10pm. Me and my sister got into our pajamas and were just sitting around watching TV when our buzzer rang. I jumped up to answer it, and it turned out to be our neighbor, the single mother. I asked her what was up, and she said that our dad's asking for us downstairs. Straight away, my stomach dropped, and I immediately asked her if she's sure that he said he was our dad. And the reason that I asked her was just to make sure that's what she actually had said. But she replied that yeah, he said that he was our dad and he was asking for us. The neighbor asked if she could let him up to our flat, but I told her no. I wanted to shout out to my sister, but I didn't want to worry her right away. I asked the neighbor not to let him come up yet and I heard her repeat this to him. I couldn't hear anything for a few minutes and I started to get really worried. At this point, my sister comes up to me and asked who it is. I called out to my neighbor a few times. It must have only been about 5 minutes, but it honestly felt like ages when she didn't reply. I was actually about to tell my sister to call triple zero because I was starting to panic and I didn't know what to do. And then she came back on and told me that he was gone. She then came up to her flat and explained what went down. She said that she was walking back to her flat after finishing work and saw a man by the buzzers. At first, she assumed that it was just someone who lived there, until they noticed her walking up. 
He asked for us by name, and if she could let him up to our flat. She asked him who he was, and he told her that he was our dad. Now obviously, she buzzed us and told us first, as our neighbor doesn't know us that well. So, she doesn't know what our dad looks like. She said that it's because we're young, she didn't want to buzz in a strange man up to our flat. She said that her motherly instinct kicked in when she heard my hesitation to let him up to the flat. Apparently after he heard me say that, he got really pushy with her and started trying to move her out of the way. He kept on saying to her, It's okay, I'm their dad. Let me in, I'm not going to do anything. She started arguing with him and asking him to tell her his name, but he refused to tell her. She told him that if I don't feel comfortable letting him in, there's no way he's getting in. His reaction was to call her a bitch and then get in his car and ride away. Now this is the reason that I hesitated. We haven't spoke to our dad since I was 16. We even considered getting a restraining order from him at one point. He's not our biological father, but we were legally adopted by him when I was 9. He was both emotionally and physically abusive to our mom and had started to do the same to me. It got to the point where we had to leave him in the middle of the night. After this, he became very controlling and would secretly follow us and record me and my sister. He had a criminal record as well, and I believe he was convicted of manslaughter in the 80s. I have no idea of the backstory behind that, and honestly, I don't want to know. Like I said, we haven't heard from him recently, and as soon as she said the word dad, I almost had a panic attack. I asked her to describe him, and she said that because it was dark out, she couldn't really see him. We ended up staying with her because my sister and I were really shaken up. I don't know whether to call the police or not. I don't know if it was really him or not, as it could easily have been someone else. I live in a house on a cul-de-sac with my mom, two brothers, and a roommate. I work two part-time jobs one of which is in the same office my mom works at. She's a doctor and I work with the medical records. I'm 20, my brothers are twins, 17, and my mom is 57, and the roommate is 18. We also live very close to a volunteer firehouse that blares an extremely loud alarm when there's an emergency. Everyone within a couple miles can hear the alarm. We are middle class and live in a modest home but I have a large front yard because our driveway is super long. Seven years ago, we moved into our house and for a while, everything was chill. Until we found out about our crazy neighbor. I'll be calling him Bob for privacy reasons. Bob has extremely paranoid schizophrenia and legitimately believes that the government is after him. He thinks that people are trying to brainwash him via microwaves and he freaks out whenever he hears a plane pass by because he thinks that they're after him. Whenever the firehouse blares the alarm, Bob calls the police because he thinks someone is coming after him, and every time they have to tell him that, he can't do that. He has also made some odd comments about one of my brothers as well. For a few years, we didn't hear much from him until one day, he sent a letter in the mail trying to sell us his baseball cards for $1 million. Apparently, he had sent the same letter to everyone else in the cul-de-sac. Everyone discarded the letters. All of our neighbors are aware of Bob. They thought that he was just a little crazy, but mainly harmless. We thought so too. We were so wrong. Last winter, we began to find mysterious footprints in the snow. It was a human's footprint across the front of our house. We knew that it wasn't any of our footprints, because none of us walked so far out into that part of our front yard like that. As I said earlier, our front yard is very large. We just shrugged it off as something odd. For a while, Bob hadn't bothered us, and we weren't thinking much of him at the time. Flash forward to a few days ago. Police were at Bob's house. Apparently he's being evicted. We kind of breathed a sigh of relief because he was weird, but we didn't think much of it. The next day after that was a normal day. Nothing odd, that was, until Bob showed up at work. He began to rant to everyone about how he's in the military, 
before going to my mom's secretary and asking to have lab work done on him. This was raising a bunch of red flags, because my mom never told him where she worked. Not only that, but to find my mom's secretary, you would have to go back behind the main row of secretaries. Each doctor has their own, and there are about 15 secretaries in total, each with their own desk, into a smaller area where a large printer is. My mom's secretary is in that smaller area, and it should be impossible for a stranger who hasn't been there before to know where she is. How the hell did Bob know where to find my mom's secretary and ask for my mom, despite not ever being there before and my mom never telling him her name? This freaked us out, and we decided to do some more research on Bob. It turns out that his dad was ex-military and that Bob owns a bunch of firearms. Bob's shady behavior towards my mom and showing up at our work could only mean one thing. This man is stalking us and he's dangerous. At the very least, we had begun to suspect that he's been going through our mail. It was also likely his footprints that were in the snow of our yard last winter. My mom got a peace order, it's kind of like a restraining order, rather quickly, and then notified all of the other neighbors about what had happened. We thought maybe things would die down now, but nope. Today, he was in the parking lot of work, staring blankly at one of the secretaries. She said that he was sweating and looked a little off. He didn't stop staring at her. He asked her about my mom again. Everyone in the family is on edge. He has guns and has been stalking my mom at work and is being evicted. He doesn't have much to lose if he did something dangerous to us. We notified the police and are making sure to lock the doors and install security cameras so that we can see if he comes onto the property again. It's been a few months since everything has happened, and I just wanted to update you guys and say that he isn't bothering us anymore. Hopefully things stay the same. A few years ago, I was renting a house in Northern California. The neighborhood was just outside the suburbs. It seemed like the perfect balance of having space and having nice neighbors close enough not to feel isolated. The area had no streetlights, so it was very dark at night, especially if there were clouds blocking the moonlight. It didn't bother me, though. It made my little house feel even more quaint on dark nights. I got home from work one day in midwinter. It was a cloudy night, so pulling up to my house, I saw only what my headlights and front porch light illuminated. When I got out of my car, I caught a whiff of a cigarette smoke. That was odd as I had never smelled that before around that house. I didn't see anybody nearby, so I ignored it and I went inside. I had just gotten off shift with a few hours of overtime, so I felt pretty tired. Even though it wasn't even 7 yet, I decided to take a shower and call it a night. I woke up sometime later, sure that I had heard a noise inside my house. I wasn't worried right away because my friend would sometimes stop by to use my shower after work on his way to his night classes. I even gave him a spare key so he could stop by even if I wasn't home. He would always text me to let me know beforehand though, and I hadn't heard my phone go off. I reached over to my bedside table and I picked up my cell phone to see if my friend had sent me a text. The bright light from my phone screen and number pad blinded me. These were the days before phones had a light sensor that would dim the screen in the dark, and this particular phone was so bright I could use it as a flashlight. Through squinted eyes, I could make out that it was 9-something, but I couldn't tell if I had an unread text or not. I set my phone aside and I called out my friend's name. There were a couple of seconds of silence before I heard loud footfalls as someone started running through the bottom floor of my house. I leapt out of bed and I ran to the closet. They were already up the stairs by the time that I had opened the door and stepped inside. That house had three rooms upstairs, two bedrooms on either side of the hallway, the one that I was in and a spare, and a bathroom at the end. The bedroom doors were both closed but the bathroom door was cracked open. I heard whoever was in my house thunder down the hallway past my door and into the bathroom. Thank god he did. That gave me enough time to open the attic axis in the ceiling of my closet and hoist myself up. 
I had just started to lift myself up when the person ran back out of the bathroom. My feet were barely inside of the attic when my bedroom door bursted open. I heard footsteps run into my room and stop. When they didn't see me in that room, they ran back to the hallway and into the other room which just had boxes stacked in a corner, some weights and a table where I painted my miniature models. I guess they decided that if someone were hiding, it would be in the bedroom because they charged back into my room and turned on the light. A moment later, the closet door was ripped open. I was crouched in my attic, just a foot or so away from the access, so I could try to stop them if they started to climb up. From my vantage point, all I could see was from about their knee down. They were wearing dirty blue jeans with frayed cuffs and worn work boots. After a few seconds of looking in the closet, they stepped away and I heard a loud crash come from my room, followed by a scream of frustration and anger. That scream was the most unnerving part of the incident for me. It reminded me far too much of my stepfather, who would scream in a similar way when he lost his temper. He would eventually be put in a mental hospital for severe mental disorders that resulted in erratic and violent tendencies. The man in my house ran back down the stairs. I heard crashes and clatters as things were thrown around and furniture was knocked over. I stayed crouched in the attic. I had left my cell phone when I ran for the closet, and I wasn't certain that I could climb down without him hearing. After some time, the noises stopped. I started counting slowly. When I reached 1,000, I decided that it was safe enough to climb down and call the police. The first thing I noticed when I exited the closet was that the intruder had flipped my bed over, I assume in an attempt to find me. That was the loud noise that I would heard after he stepped away from the closet. I couldn't find my cell phone, so I went to the landline by the bed and I called the police. I waited in my room until I heard them call out from downstairs. The first floor was a mess, but I had expected that. Chairs had been knocked over, the sofa had been flipped. All the books, pictures, and knickknacks I had on my shelves were strewn across the floor. The cupboards in the kitchen had been opened and all the boxed and canned foods had been thrown to the ground. As far as I could tell though, the only thing missing was a single knife out of the wooden block in my kitchen. The police checked the house from top to bottom. They found that the side door had been forced open by something like a crowbar. They also found a few cigarette butts along my fence line along with some foil and an empty pen tube, which the police said people often use to smoke meth, so they think that he had been watching my house for a while. I realized that he must have been out there smoking a cigarette when I got home. They collected up the evidence and told me that I should stay with family or friends tonight and get that door fixed as soon as possible. I opted to just not sleep. I moved a shelf over to block the broken door and spent the next couple hours cleaning things up. I would often go to the window with a flashlight and shine it across the fence line, where the police found these cigarette butts and foil, but I didn't see anything. The next day, I called to have the door fixed and motion lights installed at the back and sides of my house. I ran a phone cable up into the attic and added a landline. I never wanted to be stuck up there without a phone again. Nothing else happened at that house though. I lived there another three years without incident. One more precaution I took was practicing getting out of my bed, going to my closet and climbing into the attic as quickly and quietly as possible. I even kept at it when I moved. Except now, I go to a crawl space at the back of my closet instead of the attic. I try not to think about what would have happened if I had been a bit slower getting to the attic, or if he hadn't gone to the bathroom at the end of the hallway first. I lived in Japan for around 10 months a couple of years back as part of a study abroad program as my placement year for university. I lived in Hiroshima and pretty much every Japanese person I met was exactly how you would expect them. Generous and respectful. I'll accept this one old lady who just so happened to live in the apartment next to me. It was about a month after I had been in Japan. Originally I'm from Northern Ireland so it was quite an adjustment to make. When our group decided that we were going to go to the Saho Sake Festival, for those who don't know, this is a huge sake, a rice wine drinking festival, that from what I now understand, everyone goes and gets extremely drunk. 
As men of fine tasting culture, we sampled many different kinds of sake from all over Japan and got rolled off beyond belief. Then we all got the train back home to our apartments. I can't remember anything, all apart from calling my girlfriend at the time and passing out on my futon. Normal stuff. Skip to 6am the next morning, when my loud doorbell wakes me up. Keep in mind, my apartment is extremely small so the noise is extremely loud. I check the time and I'm confused as anything, but assume it's just a friend from downstairs who wants to talk about last night. I look through the people on the door and I see a police officer standing there. The first thought that went through my mind was, Taylor, what did you do when you were drunk last night? But at the same time, I was so sure that I just fell asleep right away. I talk to the dude using a translation app and he basically tells me that there's been a noise complaint. It's strange considering the fact that all I did was make a phone call and fall asleep. Anyway, the guy sees how confused I am and kind of just sees there must have been a mistake and leaves. I'm honestly still drunk and just super confused but the day carries on as normal. The next morning, 6am, the doorbell rings. I already kind of assumed what it was going to be. But what do I see through the peephole this time? Two police officers. The same conversation goes down and I convince them that there's been no noise. I literally walk into my apartment to show them how I fell asleep watching Netflix. They tell me at this point that it's the neighbor, who I've never met that's making the complaints. At this point, I think she's just got a problem with me. I ask the guy at my university who takes care of all the foreign students about this, and he tells me that I'm getting moved apartments to a room on the floor below. I'm pretty upset because I had just gotten settled into my new space, but whatever. He plans to come tomorrow morning with the landlord to move my stuff out and check if the new room is okay. Never get when you're woken up by something in the middle of the night, and it really messes you up. I went to sleep at a good time that night and prepped for the people helping me move my stuff tomorrow. So naturally, at 3 a.m., I'm fast asleep. And then suddenly, my doorbell just goes off. It's constantly ringing. It's deafening, and of course, it has woken me up straight away. I can't even begin to tell you how scared I was. Couldn't even move. I didn't want to. After about a minute of what felt like incessant noise, complete silence, I make my way over to the front door to look through the people, and I see nothing, but I just know it's that psycho neighbor. Nothing else happens that night, and I eventually get back to sleep. I wake up the next morning, still kind of shaken, but it's cool because my boys are coming around soon. I keep walking up the front to check if they're downstairs and quickly close my door behind me because I don't know what this woman will try if she sees me. And I walk into my room and I slide the door to the balcony open, and then I see her for the first time. She literally wrapped her body around the fence that separates our balconies while keeping her footing on the side, and is just staring right at me. We stare at each other for a second, and then she quickly whips back around onto her side. Literally two seconds later, my doorbell rings. And I'm just like, no way, that's not possible. This is some demon or something. Thank God, it turns out to be the people to help me move my stuff. And I tell them what's up and hastily move downstairs to my new room. Outside of her turning up at my new room once and asking if the police had came there, I was able to avoid her from then on out. I guess the police decided to start ignoring her calls. So, a crazy old lady. That's not me, 